Hey everyone, it's Tom here and welcome back to Made With Love. I absolutely loved making the first season of the podcast and it's really quite hard to pick a favourite episode because I got to speak to such incredible people. So I'll leave that up to you. But if you've not listened to all the episodes yet, they're still available for you to listen back wherever you listen to your podcasts, whenever you want. And I'm really pleased to say that we're busy working on season two, which I'm hoping will be ready to drop later this year. But I couldn't wait to share this very special episode with you. Because recently, when I was over in America for the birth of our second son, Phoenix Rose, I got to sit down with the one and only Hillary Rodham Clinton. That's Madam Secretary to you and me. But for those of you who don't know, Secretary Clinton is the first, and at time of recording this right now, still the only woman to earn a majority party's nomination for President of the United States. As well as being a history maker in her own right, she was also first lady from 1993 to 2001. And whilst in the White House, she doggedly worked across political divides to improve healthcare for children. She was also the US Senator from New York for eight years. And we talk about what it was like being Senator in 2001 when the horrific terror attacks of 9-11 sent shockwaves to her city, America, and the world. When Barack Obama was president, she was appointed his Secretary of State. No matter what your political leanings are, you can't deny that she has been a true trailblazer when it comes to women in politics and American history, and has worked tirelessly to uphold her famous message. Women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights. Over the five decades that she's been in public life, so much has changed. Let's find out what has kept her going through the good and the bad, and what inspired the little girl that would later become Secretary Clinton. So Secretary Clinton, thank you so much for joining me and joining Made With Love podcast. How are you today? I am terrific and Good. I'm really happy to talk with you. The last time I think I saw you, we were on a TV program together. Remember yes, that? Yes, the one show. <laughs> it was my first time ever actually hosting a, a live TV chat show. And I was like, and then the guests and I was like, oh my gosh, here we go. We're you really... did great. Well, oh. obviously here we are and you're I, still hosting I'm and still interviewing. I'm still hosting. I'm still doing it. And we're in New York. And I know. it's been nice to actually be able to do it in person. Is would you consider New York home to you? I mean, you've lived it, everywhere. It is now, absolutely. And we've lived here, well, since 2001, and I love it. I love New York. Uh, but I also, I grew up in Chicago in the suburbs there. I went to school uh, outside of Boston and in Connecticut, obviously lived in Washington. So I've had the great opportunity of living different places, but New York is very special. Yes. And this podcast is made with love. Mm -hmm. Now, what does being made with love mean to you? You know, it's a great title because it it means, you know, love should guide what you do. Love mm. should infuse, you know, your uh, daily comings and goings. It should be part of how you try to relate to people, really at the core of the golden rule. I mean, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So it's not just the big things we think about, you know, relationships and family. It's like everyday activities should be made with love. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, for me, I started all that stuff with knitting. Uh -huh. And that was my like thing that I like to be able to do to be able to like get away from things. And I know you have a very busy life. Like, what do you like to do to be able to escape it all? I, I like to be outdoors yeah. and particularly walking. I love going for walks, you know, in the woods, uh, at the beach, in the mountains. Um, I find that restful, meditative. Uh, I always feel virtuous afterwards <laughs> yeah. because unlike you with your athletic uh, <laughs> accomplishments, uh, I've never been in that category. But I do love walking and hiking. Those are my favorite things. And have you always been active? Like if you all the way back to your childhood, is that something yes, that you always yeah. done? Yes, yeah. But, you know, I grew up at a time, Tom, when, um, you know, your mother would send you out. You know, when you weren't going to school, if it was in the summer or on the weekends, you'd be sent out after breakfast and told to be back by dinner. I mean, people let their kids go and explore and, you know, find out more about the world outside their own little house. Um, so I've always loved being outdoors. What was childhood Hillary like for you? <laughs> like, what would your report card say? Like, what, uh, yeah. how were you in school? I stuff? was very good in yeah? school. Yeah, because my parents, particularly my father, was a big uh, proponent of education. And I was lucky. I had two younger brothers, but my father wasn't one of these, you know, depression, World War II era men who made any distinction between me and my brothers. I mean, we were all expected 
to do well in school, and and luckily for me, I did. But we also did a lot of you know outdoor activity. Um, we really had a, a combination of. Uh, you know, going to school, extracurricular. I mean, after school in the winter, we'd go ice skating. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the summers, we'd go swimming. We'd play ball. I played organized what we call softball, okay. you know, which is the, you know, women's version of baseball in many places. Um, so we were always active. And my father had been a football player in college, uh, a boxer. I mean, he really valued being outdoors, and, and so did my mother. They they both loved, you know, being out there with us. We'd play tennis. Um, we'd, you know, just be active. It was fun. And you mentioned uh, your parents. I mean, you were born after the Second World War. Yes. Like, so your upbringing must have been very different to that of your parents. It was. Yeah. yeah especially not just in terms of time, but circumstance. So, um, you know, my father, uh, his father, immigrated as a child from Northeast England. Uh, okay. His mother came from Wales. So we have all those, you know, UK roots. And uh, my father, uh, he was a small businessman, started his own company, uh, went off, as I said, five years in the Navy during World War II, came back, restarted his company. And, and we really lived the kind of middle class American dream, if you will. I was born in the city of Chicago, but we moved to the suburbs, had a really nice house, went to great public schools. Um, my mother had a very different upbringing. She had parents who were too young and irresponsible to care for her or her younger sister and basically uh, shipped them off when they were very young to go live with uh, the paternal grandparents in California. So think of this, Tom. Think of your little Robbie, yeah. um, now four years old. So my mother at the age of eight and her little sister at about the age of six were put on a train by themselves in Chicago to go all the way across the country to California. And that was an unhappy relationship. So by the age of 13, my mother was out working in somebody else's home. She basically could no longer live with her grandparents who were extremely harsh and punitive and, and joyless. Um, and so my mother started working at the age of 13 and was lucky because she worked for a family where the mother of the house, she'd been hired to take care of the children and, and literally do housekeeping and cooking for them. Uh, but that woman knew my mother wanted to go to high school. So my mother would get the children ready in the morning and literally run to high school, go to her classes and run back. But to her, that was a gift because otherwise she wouldn't have continued with her education. So she had a very different upbringing, but she was devoted uh, to our family and I'm incredibly uh, you know, grateful to her. And I mean, you continue to fight for the rights of so many people, but when was the first time where you were like, actually, I really want to help people? Like what sparked that? You know, it was really in high school and it was, I grew up in a neighborhood, I was part of the baby boom, all these, you know, families, the husbands were all World War II vets. Uh, they all had a bunch of kids. Uh, so we had dozens and dozens of kids in our neighborhood and my mother, you know, we, she taught Sunday school in our church. We, you know, were very active in church. And so it was through the church that I first began to do kind of service missions. We would, uh, you know, go to old people's uh, nursing homes and, and help them, or we would go into the inner city of Chicago and do joint projects with, you know, uh, kids, uh, black kids from a church or Hispanic kids. And then we formed in our, our little neighborhood with all of the kids there uh, a fundraising drive to give money to one of our local charities. So really from an early age, instilled by my mother, it, there was this sense of giving back mm. that, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. And we were lucky. We were knock on wood, we were healthy. Uh, we were living in a great time in American history uh, where people felt like there was all this possibility, uh, yet there were a lot of people who didn't share that. And my mother, because of her own upbringing, was very sensitive to helping others. So do you think it's your mom that kind of inspired you to Absolutely. want to help? Yeah. I, I think often my interest in, in particularly focusing on kids, you know, neglected kids, abused kids, poor kids, 
uh, kids in trouble. I think a lot of that was both from my mother's own experience and then the stories that, you know, she would tell me. Yeah, absolutely. And then you obviously have been massively involved in social justice. But was there anyone in particular that inspired you to move into the social justice movement? Yes. um, I had a youth minister. I went to a Methodist church in Park Ridge, Illinois, and the youth minister was a young, dynamic uh, pastor by the name of Don Jones. And he was determined that, you know, all these white kids in this suburb of Chicago were going to know about the outside world. So, for example, one thing that he did was to take our youth group uh, to hear Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak. So I was probably 14, and I heard Dr. King speak, and the, the, our minister, uh, Reverend Jones, you know, talked about civil rights, talked about what was going on in the civil rights movement, you know, kind of just pried open uh, the reality that we were inhabiting and said, okay, there's a lot going on outside, mm. you know, this town and these schools that you're uh, attending. So I want you to know more about it. He was instrumental. Amazing. And growing up over like, you know, dinner when you're like with your family, was politics something that was talked about a lot? And discussed? Oh, yeah, because we would argue with my oh, really? father and I would argue. Oh, my gosh. My father, you know, was a rock ribbed Republican and very conservative. Um, but you know, he and I would butt heads, you know, he would, he would get up early every morning, he would read the newspaper and he would kind of quiz me. And, uh, yeah, we had very lively dinner table conversations. I can only imagine like how that would, and how important is it to be able to like remain open to those conversations? It's so important. You know, I didn't always agree with my father, but he obviously influenced me. You know, I, I thought I was a Republican when I was in high school and my first year of college until I realized that I believed things other than that. He was very influential, but mostly not in in necessarily passing down and ensuring that I believed what he believed, but in encouraging me to learn and to speak out and to debate. Um, And I'm really grateful for that. And then you went to Wellesley College. I did. And how important and formative were those years? It was great because I had gone to what in the U.S. were called uh, comprehensive high schools, Mm. a huge high school about, oh, I don't know, at least 5,000 kids. It was enormous. And and it was a great experience, and I had exceptional teachers, but it was exhausting. Mm. (laughs) So I I had two teachers who encouraged me to apply to these, you know, very uh, well-known, well-regarded women's colleges, and Wellesley was one of them, and that's the one that I decided to go to. And uh, it was an incredible experience. I made friends of a lifetime. I had a lot of um, extraordinary professors. It was on a beautiful campus. Uh, It was hard going away from home, though. Mm. You know, when I first got there, I thought, I don't want to be here. I want to go home. And, Mm. you know, my parents said, my mother said, no, no, you have to stick it out. Um, So it turned out to be a great experience. Were those friends the first people that you almost met that were like-minded like you that wanted to make those changes? Well, they were like-minded, but they were different. It was the first time I ever went to school with African-American uh, students, first, because wow. the school I went to that I told you was at least 5,000 people, there were no African-Americans in it. Wow. And some of my very best friends from uh, Wellesley were the African-American students that I met and started working with. And we were heavy into social justice. I mean, I started at Wellesley in 1965, the middle of the civil rights movement, the beginning uh, waves of the women's movement, the war in Vietnam. President Kennedy had been you know, assassinated when I was in high school. I mean, there was so much turmoil and churn, and it was a place to really test out ideas and to learn uh, you know, what you thought, what you believed. I, I said I started off as a Republican in my freshman year for like half a year, and then I thought, I'm not. I mean, I, I, that's not what I believe. So it was a, a very formative time in my life. And when you weren't, you know, campaigning or trying to change the world and studying. <laughs> what did what did you like to do when oh, you were at college? We, we you know, we had we had a lot of fun. We the campus was so beautiful. We would spend a lot of time outdoors. Uh, we would sneak in swims, sometimes at times in places we weren't supposed to. <laughs> uh, we would go into Boston. We went to lots of uh, uh, parties, uh, what were then called mixers, oh. uh, mixers, where you go mix it up with the boys. 
Um, we went to a lot of parties uh, in Boston. We went to other schools in New England. We just had a great time. Yeah. And then you went to Yale I did. I went to Yale Law School. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was your thinking initially behind doing that? Well, in my um, senior year at Wellesley, I did my thesis on a, a gentleman named Saul Alinsky, who was a agitator, activist, change maker, who pushed the idea that communities needed to organize to demand their rights, particularly poor communities, marginalized communities. So if, you know, if you had terrible landlords in a community and your apartments were filled with rats and they wouldn't respond, organize, fight back, demand change. And I was really intrigued by uh, his story. So I wrote a thesis about him. And in the process of doing that, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I thought, well, you know, if I went to law school, I would get educated, I would get some more skills that I could maybe do more to make some of these changes that I care about uh, in society. So I decided to go to law school and I had an interesting experience because I applied to uh, three law schools. I applied to Stanford, Harvard, Yale. I got into all three. Stanford, I decided was too far away. I was in California. Mm. Had to choose between Harvard, which is in Cambridge, or Yale, which is in New Haven. So I had a friend, one of these guys I met at a mixer, uh, who was at Harvard Law School. So he invited me to come to a reception for accepted students before you made your decision. So I went to this cocktail reception uh, at Harvard Law School, and he was taking me around, introducing me, and he introduced me to this professor who looked like a character out of an old movie called Paper Chase. He was very tall, very imposing. He had on a three-piece suit. Wow. He had on a watch chain. And so my friend introduced me and said, Professor so-and-so, this is Hillary Rodham. She's trying to make up her mind between us and our closest competitor. And this guy looks down to me at me, the professor, he looks at me and he goes, well, first of all, we don't have a closest competitor. Oh. And secondly, we don't need any more women. <gasps> so oh I thought, okay, I'm not going there. And I went to Yale Law School. Wow. Yeah. That, I mean, I, it's, it's so crazy. It's hard for you to imagine, I know. isn't it? <laughs> In 2023 now, thinking that anybody could ever say, no, we don't mm. want any any more women. Like that, even that sentence coming up. We don't need up. any more women. That is so... Yeah. Th but Yale was an incredible place, so I'm uh, actually glad that I ended up there. And while you were at Yale, you met your husband I as met well. I met Bill Clinton. Uh, yeah, how were, you, how were you two drawn together? You know, I, um, I started a year before him because he went from Georgetown University as a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford. Mm. So he's a year older, but he started a year later. And so in my second year at Yale, I'm walking through the student lounge and I hear this voice say, and not only that, we grow the biggest watermelons in the world. <laughs> and I said to whoever I was with, what? Who is that? What's he talking about? And my friend said, well, that's Bill Clinton. He's from Arkansas and that's all he ever talks about. <laughs> uh, so, you know, he looked like a Viking in those days. He had long reddish hair. He had a reddish beard. Uh, I thought he was very attractive. So I would keep watching him, he would watch me. So one night in the law library, which was this very long, majestic room, I'm studying, he's at the other end. I look up from my studying, he's staring at me. I look down, I keep studying, I look up, he's still staring at me. So anyway, I put my books down. I go up to him and I say, if you're gonna keep staring at me and I'm gonna keep staring back, we at least ought to know each other's names. <laughs> I'm Hillary Rodham, who are you? Anyway, he then says, well, I couldn't remember my name. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, so then we, you know, we started hanging out and, and the rest is history, as they say. Wow, that's, yeah. and uh, look, going back to that time, like what, yeah. what did you enjoy doing together outside of school? Well, I will tell you the very first time we hung out, we, we actually happened to be in the same class, but he was never there. <laughs> and so on the last day of class, I walked out and he was there. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm in this class. I said, I've never seen you. And he goes, well, I've been campaigning for somebody. And he was doing all kinds of things. And he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the registrar to you know, sign up for my classes for next semester. This was uh, spring of 1971. He goes, oh, me too. So anyway, we walk together, we start talking, we're standing in line, We get because in those days, you know, no computers, you had to stand in line, you had to sign up, you had to register in person. 
Um, so I get up to the front of the line and Bill is standing there with me and the registrar said, Bill, what are you doing here? You already signed up. And he goes, oh, no, don't oh, pull my cover. No. <laughs> anyway, we signed, I signed up and then he said, you want to go for a walk? So we started for a walk and we walked around New Haven and we came in front of the Yale Art Museum and there was a an exhibit of Rothko, Mark Rothko, whose work I really uh, admire. And I, and, but the museum was closed because the workers were on strike. Mm. So I said to Bill, I said, oh, what a shame. We could have gone into the Rothko Museum. And he goes, oh, well, hang on, just one minute. So he disappears. Then he comes back with an older gentleman. And he says, you know, introduces me to this gentleman. He goes, he's the caretaker here. He said, if we pick up the trash, he'll let us in. So uh. we picked up the trash. <laughs> Uh, this gentleman led us in, so we had the whole museum to ourselves, and that was like literally our first date. Wow, yeah, that's that's a really it was very cool, romantic. special story. <laughs> it, that sounds very romantic. Yeah. Is uh, where you both have like a very romantic relationship at that like cute little date. Well, moment, we were just so kind of just... sizing each other up, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. And in 1978 was your first taste, I guess, of public life mm. in that way. Like, how was that? Well, actually, he ran for attorney general. Uh, in 1976, and he was elected, and then he ran for governor. And um, I, it was interesting, but I liked it. I, I liked going around meeting people, listening to people. And in Arkansas, which was a small state, you quickly got to know so many people. It, it, was, it was actually really a, a great time that we had. He ran for governor, then he was elected, he served, then he lost in 1980, then he had to come back, and, and by that time our daughter had been born, so we kind of got into an old car and you know, took Chelsea and started driving around the state because he was going to run again, and he got elected, and then he got elected you know, repeatedly, and then obviously ran for and, and was elected president. Wow. And when your daughter was born, did that change your whole, like, because obviously it, it passes through generations, how, yeah. like, you talk about your mom and your parents' upbringing and then yours, like, was that something that you were very conscious about? When I was, was really conscious of it because I was practicing law mm. and Chelsea was born in 1980 and uh, my law firm, I was the first woman to become a partner there and they didn't have anything like parental leave, certainly mm. nothing called maternity leave. And so I said to them, I said, you know, I, you know, I, I, I need to talk to you guys. And they didn't want to talk about it. It was like embarrassing. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, they didn't know what to say. So literally, Chelsea came a little early. I'm in the hospital room after she'd been delivered the night before. The phone rings. That's one of my partners. He says, well, congratulations. I heard, you know, you had a daughter, blah, blah, blah. And he says, so when are you coming back to work? And I said, well, I don't know like probably four months. And he goes, oh, okay. I mean, that, that was wow. a whole discussion because uh, we had no plan. We had no, you know, mm. uh, uh, policy at all. And, and so I kind of pioneered some of that. Um, but it was easy for me much more than for many people to balance family and work. I mean, I lived in the governor's mansion. We had help there. Not when she was born. We lived, you know, mm. in a little house of our own. But for most of her uh, childhood, you know, we... We lived there in the governor's mansion. And so we did, you know, we did have a lot of support, but it still was hard. Mm. And I always tell people that, you know, you always have that sense of, you know, I'm not doing enough. I'm, you know, feeling guilty. I mean, I should be somewhere else. So it just kind of comes with the territory of being a parent. Mm. I mean, also, you've been such a trailblazer for so many people in the way that you've been the first to do so all, many all things. All kinds of things. All <laughs> kinds of things, which... That must be challenging to make that first step to break through. You know, it is. And some of it's harder than uh, others, obviously. But um, I never thought about it like that. I never thought, oh, I think I'll go off and do this because mm. I would be the first. I always thought, well, I want to do this. And then how do I do it? And oftentimes I'd look around and I didn't have a lot of guidance because nobody had uh, come before, or nobody that I knew of. And so I had to kind of make it up as I as I went to try mm -hmm. to get things done. And were you optimistic about making change at that point? Yes, 100%. Yeah. I mean, like I say, I grew up at a time of great social, cultural turmoil, mm. but of great possibility at the same time. Yeah. And it, it was always hard. You know, I think our country, like many, um, are more status quo protective mm. than... 
uh, you expect when you get into trying to make change. Mm -hmm. So it was always a surprise. Like, why wouldn't everybody agree with me? You know, for example, one of the things that I did right out of law school was work at the Children's Defense Fund. And I worked on um, helping to gather information to convince our Congress to require that children with disabilities be allowed to go to school. Because at that time, if you had a disability, you didn't, the school didn't have to take mm. you. It just seemed to me so unimaginable. Why, you know, of course you would take every child, yeah. you know, a child who's blind, a child who's deaf, a child with cerebral palsy, a, you know, whatever the problem might be. But we had to fight for it and we had to change the status quo. So I was optimistic, but realistic about the work that had to be required. I and mean, you were fighting for, you know, women, you were fighting for, you say, for the rights of so many children to be able to even just attend, have the right, right. to attend school. Right. With that, you know, it affects like real lives. But how is that to have like the highs and the lows of that? And how do you stay motivated? You stay motivated because you really want to help people. I mm. mean, if, if I, I don't know why um, it, I would even think about being in public life if it was just to get the spotlight because it's so hard yeah. and, and there's so much that, you know, comes with it. But if you think you can help people, if you think you can make a difference, if you can change laws so, you know, in the case of kids with disabilities that go to school or then when I was in the White House, they get health care, whatever it might be that you're fighting for. Mm. But you also have to be willing to compromise to try to make some progress. You know, there are people who, you know, they don't want to compromise. They think, you know, it's all or nothing. It has to be this mm. or I'm not going to agree. But change is hard and mm. progress is challenging. So take what you can get, then build on that and keep going. Don't say, oh, well, if I'm, if I can't get everything for everybody, I'm not going to go with you. And, and that's just not the way change happens. And in a society like ours. And it must be really tough as well when you're having sometimes those doors slammed in your face yes. and people not wanting to yes. have anything to do with it. Like it must be challenging as well, just to maintain true to yourself sometimes as well. Well, and to maintain your, you know, to maintain your calm, your cool, yeah. not to get emotional. And mm. I've not always succeeded. I mean, it's difficult. I mean, when, for example, in the 90s, I was working on health care reform to try to get our country to universal, affordable, quality health care, um, I was just like astonished. I would go to these events to talk to people in business mm. or people in politics and I would tell them these stories that had been so moving to me. You know, I remember I was at the Children's Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio, yeah. and I was meeting with parents who had children with very serious health challenges. They could not get insurance. And in our society, as you probably know, um, if you're poor enough and you have to be pretty poor, you can get government help with health insurance. If you work for an employer, who will provide insurance, you can get health insurance. But if you're kind of in that empty space between where you make too much money to qualify for government support, but you don't work for somebody who's going to provide you health care, you're kind of lost. And these parents were telling me these stories. And a father said to me, he said, I have, you know, two children with uh, cystic fibrosis and I, I can't get insurance for them because they have what are called pre-existing conditions. Yeah, they were born mm. with cystic fibrosis. So I can't get insurance. And he said, you know, I make enough money. I run my own business. I can't afford insurance policy, but I can't get it anywhere. And I said to him, I said, what do they say to you when you go and say, look, I can afford an insurance policy. Why won't you give me a policy? And he looked at me and he said, well, the last time I had that conversation, the insurance agent said to me, you don't understand we don't insure burning houses. I mean, that was oh just gosh. like gasp inducing. Yes. And I t would tell these th stories like that to people who were in a position to make a difference and it just didn't register. It was like, well, that's really too bad. You know, I hope that family gets some help, mm. but we're not changing the law. So you have to have a lot of resilience, determination, even stubbornness uh, to keep going in the face of setbacks. And then in 2000, you ran for Senate yourself. Yes. Like, yes. Talk to me a little bit about why that became really important. Well, I hadn't really planned to. And uh, the one of the two senators in New York announced that he was retiring. Mm. And all of a sudden, people from New York started calling me saying, you need to run, you need to run. And 
I said, no, I'm not going to run. I've never thought about that. I'm going to do other things. And they just kept it up. They kept it up. They came to see me. They brought me polling data. They brought me all kinds of, you know, information they thought would persuade me. And in the spring of 1999, I was at an event in New York City uh, to highlight women in sports. Mm. And uh, like Billie Jean King was there. I mean, you know, really sport iconic women. And um, I was going to speak to promote this documentary called Dare to Compete. Mm. And um, I was introduced by the captain of the basketball team, this very, you know, dynamic young woman. And so she introduces me and I go up to shake her hand and thank her. And she's a lot taller than me. Mm -hmm. And she leans over and she whispers in my ear, dare to compete, Mrs. Clinton, dare to compete. And I thought, wow, you know, I go around telling women they should get out there. They should, you know, yeah. take on hard things. And maybe I'm scared. I mm -hmm. mean, you have to be honest. Maybe I, I maybe the reason I say I don't want to do this is because it's like really scary. So then I started seriously thinking and then I decided, okay, I'm going to give it a try, see what happens. And I mean, in that first year, you had one of the toughest years of any New York senator it ever. It was horrible. And when 9-11 yeah. happened, right. um, you know, tell me a little bit about that experience. Well, you're right. I mean, I had been a senator since January. Uh, and so I was beginning to, you know, find my way around and, and uh, understand the job. And 9-11 happens. And it was so brutally horribly shocking. And I knew immediately that it would take up a lot of my time uh, as a senator because it's so many people killed. How would we take care of their families? There were some people grievously injured. So much of lower Manhattan was destroyed. The environmental hazards from what had been, you know, obliterated and sent into the air was obvious to me from my very first visit because I went to ground zero uh, the day after on September 12th, along with, you know, the other senator and the governor and the mayor and others. So it was uh, just such a shocking, uh, horrific event, uh, but I immediately had to get to work. Mm. How do you stay resilient from something like that? I mean, you've had to be resilient in your career, but yeah. that must have been really tough. It was. It was incredibly hard. And the stories that I began to hear... Um, you know, people losing their husband, their father, their mother, their sister, their daughter, their son, their loved one, whatever. It was so painful. And, you know, the stories of the last words they heard as people were calling, you know, trapped in the towers. One of the very first victims was a uh, Franciscan uh, priest who... Uh, I had gotten to know, and he was a chaplain uh, to the fire department, and he was, you know, he, along with the, you know, firefighters, rushed to the scene, and he was hit by a, you know, piece of, you know, falling debris and died, and, and so it was all very personal, and it, I met people who had businesses where, you know, 300, 350 people died, mm. um, the firefighters, the police officers who were killed. I mean, it was just uh, a, a huge gaping loss. Uh, but I also, because I was in the Senate, had an enormous responsibility. And that's what kept me going. Like, what can I do? How can I help? You know, where do I need to be? I mean, you constantly impress me and strike me as this incredibly strong woman to keep pushing, keep fighting for people that don't necessarily have the you know, opportunity to be able to fight for themselves. That's and, exactly right. And that's why it's all the more inspiring, you know, your campaign going into 2016. It was, you know, it must have been incredibly grueling to have to go through. I mean, every nom nominee goes and travels around the country and is talking all the time. Like, what was it that kept you going? I was um, very uh, determined that uh, I, I would go everywhere I could, speak to as many people as possible, because I was asking them to do something we've never done before, namely vote for a woman mm. uh, to be our president. And I knew that it was going to be a little bit of cognitive dissonance for some people uh, to actually uh, decide they could do that. 
So it it was a grueling campaign, and there were you know lots of moments when I would just be exhausted. But I always felt like every day was a new day, and get up and get out and see what's happening, and see how many people you can persuade uh, to your side. Uh, and uh, the primary was you know challenging, but I got through that and and you know had a convincing win there, and then we got into the general election against somebody who from the very beginning was, you know, basically um, selling hate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We'd never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd you'd seen tricky candidates trying to disguise their messages. Uh, You know, Richard Nixon uh, talking about the silent majority, which was kind of a a dog whistle to people who uh, were worried about blacks getting full rights or poor yeah. people having, you know, equal opportunity, or Ronald Reagan who would go speak uh, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where civil rights workers had been murdered, but you know, talk about states' rights, which was another kind of you know message. But he did it with a smile, and he was so personable. Um, Talk, you know, George W. Bush with compassionate conservatism. You know, previous candidates had sent a message that, you know, I'm with you, not with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a divisive message, but kind of under the surface, so to speak. Mm. I mean, Trump started his campaign railing against immigrants, calling them names, accusing them of crimes, and never stopped. And uh, it was you know, something we'd never dealt with before. I think the press didn't know how to cover it. They fell into false equivalencies. If I say something bad about him, I got to think of something bad to say about her because I have to look like I'm fair. No, he was a clear and present danger to our country, as it turned out, even worse than I had imagined. So it was a very tough campaign. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, you know, between what the director of the FBI did and what, you know, Putin did and what, you know, Cambridge Analytics and the Trump campaign did lying about me on Facebook and all the rest of it. It was just, it was, it was hard. I won the popular vote in any other country. Obviously I would have been elected, but in our country you have to win the electoral college and it was, you know, razor thin, but didn't go my way. And who was there as your greatest support through that time? My husband, he was great. Yeah. Yeah. My husband, you know, he, he was worried about the campaign the whole time because uh, the dark underbelly of America is always there. And you have to, if you're a leader, kind of try to keep it down and, you know, to the side. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't let it burst its ugly bubble and really, you know, engage in hate and discrimination and, and what we're now seeing. So he always knew that it was a a very difficult environment that you know we were kind of moving into a different kind of politics um but he he you know was great all during the campaign and and obviously uh at the end and I mean regardless of the outcome you know what i it still gives me goosebumps thinking about it when you talk about the glass ceiling and yeah, yeah. the fact that Every single day, every single day that you continue to keep fighting, that glass ceiling is cracking. I know. We Thousands just have to of cracks. Just keep pushing it. <laughs> we have to keep pushing it because that glass ceiling, it will break with it enough will. pressure. It, it will. It will break. Yeah. And after 2016, you've gone on to do so many different initiatives. Um, you know, I attended one of the uh, events that you did in London uh, with the Global Initiative. Like, talk to me a little bit about what mm-hmm. you've done since and what you want to continue to fight for? Well, I'm, I'm working in several areas. I, I've continued to be politically um, active in supporting candidates and causes that I believe in, and I started a group called Onward Together to be able to do that. Mm. And I'm very proud of the groups that are part of it, and we raise money for them and raise their visibility and connect them with others, and then the you know, candidates who uh, I believe can, you know, really continue the fight. But my philanthropic work is really focused at the Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Global Initiative because uh, it's a great way of bringing people together to help solve problems. You know, Bill started the Clinton Global Initiative. It went through 2016. Then it was on hiatus. We brought it back last September. And it was just wonderful because people wanted to be together to talk about what we could do in a positive way. Mm. 
there was so much negativity and fear around COVID. And people were quite unsettled. And I, I think it was true in both the UK. It certainly was true in the US and elsewhere around the world. And, and people stopped getting together. They stopped being with each other, working um, at the same time in the same place. So by bringing it back, we said, hey, we're, we're going to bring people back together. We're going to focus on, on health, health equity. Uh, what do we do to improve mental health, uh, pandemic preparedness, women's health? We're going to focus on economic opportunity and empowerment. You know, we've got to do a better job lifting people up. We're going to focus on climate change. Um, how do we help people get more resilient and prepared? And of course, my continuing focus on, on women and girls and mm -hmm. their rights and their opportunities. So I'm very, very uh, involved and excited about everything that I'm doing. I just got back from India where I'm working with a group that I've worked with for 30 years called the Self-Employed Women's Association. Two and a half million women, some of the poorest of the poor women who do really hard work outside, they're trash pickers, they're trash recyclers, they're salt rakers, they're construction workers. I mean, it's really hard work. Mm. And they've always had to work hard. But now they're facing extreme heat. Yeah. I mean, how do you work at 128 degrees, right? Uh, yeah. So I am working with a lot of like-minded people and groups to find solutions in all of these areas that I am involved in. And what's your ultimate piece of advice for resilience? Believe in something bigger than yourself. Don't get mired in all the problems that every one of us has to deal with in life. Nobody's life is perfect. Nobody's life is smooth. You got to figure out how to get back up when you're knocked down. But I've always found it easier to get back up if I feel like I'm doing something that is not just going to help me, but help others. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my mentors, uh, Marion Wright Edelman, who started the Children's Defense Fund, <clears throat> you know, famously uh, said, uh, you know, service is the rent we pay for living. Mm. And I really believe that. I mean, we are, you know, every day can be uh, an extraordinary experience mm. and, and do the best you can with it. The last part of the podcast, I ask each of my guests to say a little bit of a made with love letter to practice a little bit of gratitude, something that's addressed to a person, place or thing that made them with love. Ah. Now, I don't know if you have anything prepared. Some people do. Some people want to just think of someone or something and yeah. just let it be known. So well, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. I have thought about this a lot because um, in the course of, you know, my life, there have been high points and low points. And, you know, you've got to figure out how to uh, keep moving through those low points. Mm -hmm. And I uh, stumbled on a phrase that means the world to me called the discipline of gratitude. Uh, and it was in a book by a very uh, socially active and aware Catholic priest named Henri Nouwen, who uh, wrote a book about the parable in the New Testament of the prodigal son, mm. which uh, was a really important book to me when I read it, you know, back in the 90s, because he basically said, look, you have the ability to be grateful no matter what's happening, but it's a skill that has to be practiced. And so the discipline of gratitude is looking for a way uh, to find that gratefulness every day in something. Mm. You know, grateful that you wake up in the morning, grateful that a friend of yours got through a serious illness, grateful that you go outside and it's beautiful, grateful that, you know, Robbie is happy. Whatever it is that mm. you find, practice the discipline of gratitude. And so it's something that I actually think a lot about. And I'm very grateful to many, many people who have made a huge difference in my life, starting uh, with my parents, but particularly my mother. And, you know, finding that resilience and that internal fortitude to keep going when times are hard, you need some hooks. Um, and I think the learning to practice the discipline of gratitude could be that for people. It is a very powerful thing to be able to just take the time to 
appreciate what you have and appreciate how far you've come as well. And I mean, your mum sounds like an incredible. I wish I. Oh, could she would have, have met loved her. you. Oh. oh my God, she would have <laughs> loved you. Oh, so <laughs> sweet. Now, uh, my last question to you is: What are your hopes for the future? What left do you have to conquer and achieve? Oh. Well, they're not hope so much for myself. Um, you know, I hope the best for my grandchildren. I now have three grandchildren, an eight-year-old girl, six-year-old boy, three-year-old boy. And obviously I hope the world for them, everything that will make them happy, fulfilled, give them a purposeful life and, you know, be grateful. But I, I'm really hoping a lot for our country and the world that we get through this a period of war and conflict and authoritarianism and people trying to turn the clock back on women's rights and gay rights and a sense of possibility mm. uh, that should be our birthright. Um, so I am doing everything I can to try to keep lifting up the positive and pushing back the negative, uh, trying to do things that are made with love, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, so my hopes are really not so much for me because I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing because yeah. I love it and I get a lot out of it. But it's really so that others can uh, have the, you know, the same uh, opportunities to flourish and uh, make a difference. You just completely said exactly what this whole podcast is about. <laughs> the passion that you have every sing and making it to the thing that you do every day and continue to fight for. So thank you so much for joining me on Made With Love. It's been very special and very inspiring. So thank you. Thank you. Wow, I feel so lucky to have had the chance to sit down with Secretary Clinton. And when I say she is one of the kindest souls, when we arrived and we were setting up, I brought along my son, Robbie, and brought Lance, her husband, and my mum, and she took the time to speak with us and to be able to take photos with us and was just so kind. And I feel incredibly honoured to have sat down with her and had the chance to speak to her about so many things because there was so much wisdom in there from a woman who has pretty much seen and done it all. But I'd love to know what you thought of that episode. So let me know in the comments below or write a review wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was hosted by me, Tom Daly, produced by Emma Roberts and engineered by Tom Ross for Spiritland Productions. As I mentioned, series two of Made With Love is in production. So hit the follow button to make sure you don't miss it when it drops.